Throughout the years, scholars, fans, and everybody in between have tried to speculate on what the Lord of the Rings is about. And no, I don't just mean, you know, throwing an evil ring in a volcano. I mean thematically. Many people propose that the Lord of the Rings is actually about the futility of war and conflict, or that it's nature versus industrialization, or forgiveness, or Christianity, or any of the other myriad components that pop up in its plot at one point or another. While none of these are wrong, and they all do warrant further discussion, Tolkien himself claimed that one theme was at the very center of his great epic. The real theme, for me, is about something much more permanent and difficult. Death and immortality. So today we're going to be examining these topics in Tolkien's works, how each of the free peoples of Middle-earth perceive and experience death, and why this theme is so pivotal to Tolkien's world. I'm Jess, and today we are going to be exploring death and immortality in The Lord of the Rings. But before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit more about today's sponsor. I don't know if you guys know this, but Tolkien, the guy who wrote The Lord of the Rings, he was a pretty big fan of languages. It was one of his main passions that drove him to create The Lord of the Rings and Middle-earth. Which is why I am so excited to announce the sponsor of today's video, Babbel, one of the world's top language learning apps. I've always been fascinated by languages, and I took German all throughout high school, but after graduating, I never found enough time to keep up with it. But lately, I've been able to start getting back into the swing of things with Babbel, a language learning app developed by real language teachers that is scientifically proven to get you speaking a new language in just three weeks. The lessons are simple, but just challenging enough, and super, super convenient since you can just do them on your phone. <laughs> Ich komme aus Deutschland. Ich komme aus Deutschland. I've only been back at it for a few days, but I can already say, Hallo, ich heiße Jessica und ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch. If you want to check out Babbel and begin working towards your language learning goals, feel free to check out the link in my description to get 60% off your subscription. Thank you so much to Babbel for sponsoring this video and to all of you for clicking on my links when I have them. It really goes a long way to help support this channel. And now back to the video. Let's lay the groundwork first by talking about Tolkien, a man who was pursued by death for most of his life. When Tolkien was just three years years old, his father, who's away working in South Africa, died, leaving only his mother and his brother Hilary as immediate family. Though the years following this were fairly happy, as Tolkien's mother taught him language and stories, she unfortunately also passed away when Tolkien was only 12. This death seemed to leave a particular wound for Tolkien, and the memory of his mother and her untimely death would loom over much of his work and philosophy for the rest of his life. Just a few years later, he would be dragged unwillingly into the trenches of World War I directly into the Battle of the Somme. The conflict at the Somme is known as one of the most brutal and bloody battles of the entire war, and there Tolkien witnessed death and destruction at an inconceivable level. And upon being discharged due to trench fever, he would come to learn that many of his school friends, and in fact I think it was all but one, died in the Battle of the Somme. It was during his time enlisted in France that Tolkien began work on the world that would eventually become Middle-earth, and this also came at a time when he was beginning to re-engage with his Catholic faith. Catholicism in particular is not shy about death. It comes up frequently in its teachings, and phrases such as memento mori, which means remember your death, are used to remind believers of the fragility of life and the inevitability of death. And since Tolkien was so deeply entrenched in Catholic teachings and philosophy, it makes sense that his writings would also not shy away from the topics of death and dying. And so, as death was a very present part of his life from a young age, and so important to his personal philosophy, it makes a lot of sense that it would become a central theme in his works going forward. But interestingly, despite his intimate relationship with death, the central players of Tolkien's world, the elves, are bestowed with the gift of immortality. The elves are known as the firstborn children of Middle-earth's primary god, Eru Eluvatar, and they were given lots of great perks for being first, including breathtaking beauty and unmistakable wisdom. And as the first and foremost creations of Middle-earth, elves share an unbreakable bond with the physically created world. Tolkien explains that elves die not till the world dies, unless they are slain or waste in grief. 
Neither does age subdue their strength. So yes, they actually can die, but they are still immortal, which seems like a little bit of an oxymoron until we look into what Tolkien meant by death. And in his world, the exact definition of death is simply the separation of soul from body. So elves can die technically, both of physical injury and immense sadness, which happens a couple of times in the Legendarium, but their souls won't perish or disappear until the end of the physical world. But after being separated from their bodies, their souls go to the halls of Mandos, the Valar or God of judgment and death, who chooses what will become of these lost souls. From there, their spirits are either placed into new bodies, basically reincarnated, or if they were, you know, particularly bad eggs, they might just be left to wander Middle-earth disembodied forever as punishment. But unlike in a lot of popular media, this immortality isn't strictly a good thing. Elves may live forever, but they do eventually grow tired, as I'm sure any of us would after living for, for centuries upon centuries. Upon growing weary of the trials and tribulations of life on Earth, elves have two options. They can either fade and become powerless and immaterial, or they can choose to cross over into Valinor, the land of the gods, and live there happily in their physical form forever. But this isn't a perfect alternative. One of the essays that I read for this video, which I will be linking in the description, says that at the elves' departure then, there is always a sadness at the thought of being forever separated from the other people of Middle-earth, especially mortals whose destiny they have shared for so many ages. Elves are powerful and immortal, but with that comes a sort of sorrow, because Middle-earth will not last forever, and the elves, whose souls are intrinsically tied to its fate, will likewise eventually fade away. But that is not the destiny of everyone in Middle-earth. Dwarves, for example, are not immortal. It feels important at this moment for me to bring up the fact that Middle-earth was most definitely a work in progress. Tolkien was constantly making adjustments and changes to his work, so while some things are fairly well explored and kind of set in stone, such as the elves' immortality, things like the fate of the souls of dwarves are not so fully explored within the context of the lore. So all of this video, as well as just all of my videos, should be taken with a grain of salt because Tolkien's canon went through many different iterations and I'm kind of just trying to do the best some of its parts. Of course, there are extra layers of complication when you try to examine the fate of the dwarves because within the context of the story, they are also a very secretive people. They even kept their true names a secret, so secret that they wouldn't put their real names on their gravestones in case outsiders would come and see them. So really we're working through two layers of confusion because outside the story, Tolkien's notes about the dwarves were pretty incomplete. And then within the context of the story, nobody still knows what's going on with them. But I will share what we do know, which is that dwarves had very specific burial practices. They cared well for their deceased, entombing them in stone, but never burying them in the dirt. This was a vital practice, and it was only ever passed over in cases where there were just far too many bodies for them to do a proper burial. And the only recorded instance of this was the Battle of Azal Nuzubar, the most bloody battle in dwarven history. At the end of the battle, there were so many bodies that the dwarves ended up having to burn them, something that they would call grievous. And it's likely that they place so much importance on properly entombing bodies because they have some kind of teaching about the resurrection of the body after death. According to the dwarves' own beliefs, the god that created them, Aule, cares for them and gathers them to Mandos in halls set apart, and that he declared to the fathers of old that Iluvatar will hallow them and give them a place among the children in the end. So their souls will leave their bodies when they die, but once their spirits pass on, they will be held separate from elves, men, or hobbits in the halls of Mandos, and eventually, they're set to share in the fate of the souls of men. This belief doesn't necessarily line up with what elves and men think happen to the souls of dwarves, but at least dwarves themselves seem pretty confident that they will eventually be 
reincarnated in some way, especially in the case of their great leaders. Whilst wandering the once hallowed halls of Moria, also called Casa Doom, Gimli sings a poem about the great dwarven leader Durin I. He sings of the vibrance and glory of Durin's life and time in sharp contrast to the cold emptiness of Moria now. The world is gray, the mountains old, the forge's fire is ashen cold. No harp is rung, no hammer falls, the darkness dwells in Durin's halls. The shadow lies upon his tomb, in Moria, in Casa Doom, but still the sunken stars appear in dark and windless mirror mirror. There lies his crown in water deep, till Durin wakes again from sleep. Within the context of their own beliefs, the dwarves seem convinced that they shall one day wake again a certainty not granted to the last group of free peoples, men. Men, the creatures woken in Middle-earth just after the elves, are given something called the Gift of Iluvatar. And this gift is unfortunately not a good kind of gift, like the Betty Crocker bacon fill, but uh, death. Yeah, the uh, gift of Iluvatar is, it's just death. Tolkien writes, the sons of men die indeed and leave the world, wherefore they are called guests or the strangers. Death is their fate, the gift of Iluvatar, which as time wears, even the powers shall envy." So there at the end, you have why Tolkien calls this a gift. The ability to die, to have your soul be unbound from the fate of Middle-earth, is a privilege that the elves and even the Valar, the gods of Middle-earth, shall one day come to envy. The destiny of mankind is not laid out before them. It's not bound to the inevitable fate of Middle-earth itself. Instead, men choose their own path, forge their own destinies, and in the end, die on their own terms. And after they die, unlike elves, their souls do not remain. They pass through the halls of Mandos like elves, but after that, who knows? The only real hint that we have is that they may come to be part of a new world. A second creation that comes after the great battle at the end of time, Dagor Dagoroth, a new resurrection that puts souls back into their bodies. And this idea falls beautifully in line with the Catholic teaching of the second coming and the resurrection of the body. Catholicism teaches that at the end of time, Jesus Christ will return and defeat death itself. All human souls will be returned to their bodies and the just shall be perfected in the eyes of God. Of course, Tolkien didn't intend for the Lord of the Rings or Middle-earth to be overtly religious in any particular way, but looking into the Catholic teachings that Tolkien would have believed or at least known of, we get an idea of what may eventually occur to the men in his legendarium. It's not just men that will share in this fate, but everybody's favorite, hobbits. In a letter, Tolkien made it clear that hobbits are, of course, really meant to be a branch of the specifically human race. So it follows that they were also given the gift of Iluvatar, and that whatever second coming may eventually be in store for man, will also be the fate of the hobbits. This is great, not just because I, I think hobbits are cool, but also because throughout the narrative, hobbits are overtly used as an audience insert. Tolkien set them up to be the most accessible and relatable characters in the narrative, an easy place where we can step in and see how we might respond in these situations. So by allowing hobbits to share in the fate of men, I think Tolkien is trying to tell us something. Death is hard. It's, it's frightening and it's been on my mind a lot lately. In this upcoming section, I am going to be talking about the death of my pets. So if that's not something that you want to hear now or ever, uh, feel free to skip ahead to this timestamp. I have pet rats, fancy rats, and recently, within um, literally a week of each other, two of them passed away. And I'm relatively new to rat ownership, so I had only had one die before, my boy Leofric. It was a pretty sudden onset brain tumor, but I had about a week to come to terms with things, and when I took him in to put him down, it was hard, but 
I had some time to prepare. But when my boy Osmond died just recently, I only knew he was sick for a couple of days. I had him in at the vet on Saturday because I thought he, he might be getting a bit of a cold. And that was on Saturday and then by Monday he had stopped eating and I took him into the vet and he was looking up into my eyes as he took his last breath. And then just a week later, um, this Monday, I brought my rat Bertram in for a routine surgery, what well, was supposed to be a routine surgery. And um, when I thought I was getting the call to come pick him up, uh, it was actually the call that he, he had suddenly stopped breathing. The vet doesn't really know what happened. Um, and honestly, that morning I hadn't even, I hadn't even properly said goodbye to him because I thought it would, I thought I'd just have him back in a couple of hours, but he was just gone. It's really, really hard owning rats and, you know, any small animal because they have such short lifespans. The average lifespan of a rat is about two years and, and Bertram got exactly that. He died on his second birthday. And for humans, that's so hard for us to take in because how can something go from being this scared little baby that you're just getting to know to being an old man to, to just being gone in two years? To us, their whole lifespans just feel like a moment. A lot of animals just live like a fraction of our lives. And I think almost because of that, not, not in spite of that, their lives burn all the brighter. My rats that have passed had the, the biggest personalities, the, the fullest lives, and they loved me so, so much. And although their lives felt like a blink to me, it's not something I would ever trade for the world. Those little guys made as much out of their lives as they possibly could. And although it's kind of silly to say, I think that Tolkien's humans are a lot like my rats in some ways. They live pretty short lives, at least in the eyes of elves, but because of that, they burn so, so much brighter. They grow up fast and they fall in love even faster, but even though they do die, they live every single moment of those precious lives like they really count. That's why this type of life, the fleeting, beautiful, brilliant lives of human beings is so central to Tolkien's story. Tolkien saw how delicate life was, how integral it is, how unpredictable and terrifying it is, but how it's so utterly irreplaceable. I believe that Tolkien was proposing that without death, you never really learn how to live. And maybe that is a little morbid, um, and maybe you guys will have a different take on it. But by making death and immortality the central theme of The Lord of the Rings, I think that Tolkien was trying to tell us something about life, that it's precious, it's fast and frightening and beautiful and it's worth living. I would love to hear what you guys think about this. Death is kind of a hard topic to approach sometimes because um, nobody really wants to think about it a whole lot, but I think that talking about it within the context of stories like The Lord of the Rings can sometimes help broach these difficult topics. So I'd love it if you guys discuss this in the comments, but you know, in a, in a gentle and respectful way. If this video made you think about The Lord of the Rings a little bit differently, maybe you could leave it a like or subscribe because I make these kind of videos every single week and I'd love to have you join me here. I hope you guys like my new studio. I am hoping to get some things on these walls probably because they're a little bit blank right now and I'm still settling in and figuring out lights and camera and everything, but I really like it, so I hope you guys like the new space. Thank you all so much for watching to the end of the video and checking out the link in the description to get Babbel because uh, it's really nice when you guys help support my sponsors and I really appreciate it when sponsors help support me making more content. Thank you all so much for watching, I appreciate you all, and I hope that you all have a very happy hobbity day.